Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Ivan, and uh, I do machine learning at Flow. Uh, before we start, let's, well, first of all, apologies for like the clickbait name. I was also asked to make it sort of juicy and uh, provocative. So I don't have anything against churn models. And by the way, uh, who of you has ever built a churn model? Anyone? Yeah, cool. Awesome. Hopefully you will enjoy it. So uh, before we begin, a few words about the company. So Flow Health is uh, a female health application. Uh, we are basically very ambitious and we try to be the essential health part partner for one billion uh, female, uh, like basically women in the world. Uh, and right now we are on a good track because we have currently 250 million installs. We are the number one health app in the App Store, I think for three years in a row and probably this, this year as well. And fun fact that uh, in the previous year we surpassed uh, an interesting uh, milestone of uh, 1 billion menstrual cycles locked in the app. So this is like a lot of data and uh, we are lucky to work with that. So uh, what's actually wrong with churn models? Why like the uh, provocative title. Imagine uh, that uh, we sort of have this uh, health application and uh, someone built a churn model, some data scientists or like machine learning people, they built a churn model and uh, it's apparently good at predicting that uh, some particular user will be sort of leaving their premium subscription uh, in, in, in a short amount of time, for example with a 90% probability. Wow, that's really bad. So we need to do something about that, right? Uh, and the best thing we can do is probably, it depends on sort of the product people and for, on those who handle that. But basically what we can do, we can say, please don't go, let's sort of uh, give you some discount or extend your subscription or promote some new feature or send you a push notification or whatever. So basically we do whatever it takes to sort of uh, make this user stay and not leave. We are really sort of interested in that, right? But there's a lot of questions uh, with this. Basically, um, so I, I just mentioned 90% probability, but is it actually a good threshold? It sort of might be uh, the case that we need a lower threshold or a higher threshold. And I honestly don't have the answer like what, what's a good threshold or not, because it's up to the person uh, to decide what it is. Um, another question is, uh, when you communicate with users uh, who are about to churn, do you actually lose money or not? Because, uh, for example, push notifications are most likely for free, but discounts or SMS notifications if you work in retail, for example, or email notifications, all of that costs you money. So you really need to account for that as well. Another question is, uh, if the user is going to take your sort of promotion at all, she might sort of be, uh, no, I'm, I'm going to leave anyway, so I don't really need your sort of discount and, and all that stuff. Uh, so she might not take it. And another uh, question on this topic is, if we can sort of, uh, if we're interested in keeping as, mo as many users as possible and we can give them some treats, let's say, why not give it to everyone, right? Why do we need sort of a churn model and, and stuff like that? And these are valid questions to ask. I don't have answers to them. Uh, and, and that's why like the overall concept of modeling churn might be not the best approach when you already have a lot of data and like a big user base. Uh, because in regular churn modeling, the mindset, like the default state is the following. We basically built a churn model uh, in order to minimize churn because we believe that by minimizing churn we will maximize, insert your metric, right? Uh, it can be anything, so, sort of retention, or in our case we are mostly focusing on uh, revenue per user. Uh, but the key idea is that uh, data scientists and machine learning people, they usually are very good at building the first part because they are sort of good at machine learning. But in the end of the day, uh, maximizing anything you want to maximize using the model's output is still a human heuristic, right? So you take the numbers and you do something with them because you as like a specialist decided to do so, which might be not the best thing to do. And that's why uh, people invented uplift modeling, which is basically a little paradigm shift where you say, we want to maximize this metric. Period. So that's it. And for that, we built a special model, which is called uh, an uplift model, which is not actually magic, uh, and we'll dive into it in a minute. Uh, but before that, we'll look also at the standard setup. So what you need in terms of data and uh, in terms of uh, basically uh, features and, and, and what has to be presented to the models. 
so usually uh, in classical machine learning, you have in, like basically tabular machine learning, you have a uh, data set with features and uh, target column, which you try to predict, right? And here we have almost the same setup, except uh, for the treatment column. So this is uh, essentially the column that represents your treatment. It's a binary flag that says like this user got their promotion or discount and this one not. And for the sake of simplicity, usually the treatment color, uh, column is also a binary one. And the target uh, column, like the target uh, metric you predict, can be actually like your final business metric. So it can be directly revenue as we do, or it can be conversion, or it can be the fact that the user uh, didn't leave your app, although you expected them to leave, and so on. So that's what you usually have in terms of data. Uh, and then um, it's also worth uh, looking into the data itself. So basically, in the uh, scope of uplift modeling, there are usually four types of users in your data set, uh, which is very interesting to consider because uh, you as like the person who tries to maximize something uh, by interacting with your users, you are really interested in the persuadables, like the so-called persuadables group. These are basically those users who are uh, otherwise not willing to do what you want them to do, so they don't want to convert, they don't want to stay in your app, but you give them something and they're actually okay with that. They say, you know what, cool, I'll, I'll, I'll stay with your app. Uh, then there's another big group which is called lost causes. These are basically those guys who left because you didn't give them anything. So these are those who otherwise would be persuadables, but you didn't give them any treatment, so they decided to sort of leave. And uh, we're really interested to make them move uh, from, from that uh, quadrant to the lower one. Another, uh, like, I think the best group of customers is actually uh, the ones in the lower left quadrant. These are called the so-called the so sure things. And these are your most uh, loyal customers. So whatever like you do, they will stay, they won't churn, they will buy anything you give them. And you basically don't need to give them any discounts, any promotions, any sort of specialized communication. They are your most loyal customers, they will stay anyway. And I think the most tricky one and like well, also very interesting is the so-called sleeping dogs or do not disturbs. Uh, this is a group of customers. In some problems they are rare, in some problems not. Uh, but they are basically those guys who, when communicated with, they will actually leave. A good example is, uh, imagine uh, I have a Netflix subscription. Uh, it's automatically being paid every month, but I don't actually use Netflix. And Netflix decide to sort of uh, give me a discount because I don't use Netflix. And they say, hey, here's your 10% discount for the next month. I'm looking at this mes message and thinking to myself, oh, wow, I need to cancel Netflix. So that's basically the, the idea behind those guys. And this is a real case, like in different problems. So uh, uplift model, models in general are really good at considering uh, all of these groups and sort of distinguishing between them. Uh, and a few formal definitions just for you so to sort of know. Uh, in general, we are trying to estimate the so-called causal impact. Uh, this is basically the business metric under treatment, so with the one, minus the business metric uh, you try to predict uh, under no treatment. So what's the difference if treated minus if not treated? More precisely, uh, for every specific user, uh, it's called conditional average treatment effect, or Kate for short. Uh, it's basically the same, but for every given user, what's the expected behavior of this user under treatment minus the expected behavior without treatment? So that's very simple, right? But there's a hook. Uh, it's actually impossible to observe both the outcome, like both the behavior of the user under treatment and without treatment, because you don't have two parallel universes, right? You can't sort of take one person and say, hey, you get this discount, but you also don't get it. And now we observe what you will do, because <clears throat> we only have one universe, unfortunately, so we need to uh, think about the workaround here. And the workaround here is uh, conducting A-B tests, which we love and uh, conduct a lot, hopefully. Uh, basically, we need to conduct a randomized controlled experiment or A-B test. Then, under certain assumptions, for example, uh, the most important of them is the so-called unconfoundedness, which means in human language that we assume that our A-B test was fair and the group assignment was not related to any user features or any specific signal from the users themselves. It has to be really random. If this assumption is true and if the ra random test is really random, then you can use the data set you collect during the A-B test to train your uplift model and then the Kate, like the conditional average treatment effect, can be estimated as the difference of the model prediction for treated, like for as if there would be treatment minus uh, the prediction without treatment. I hope you can see that. So basically this difference is, is the estimation of, of uh, 
the uplift itself. Uh, like the true Kate can, as like I said, never be observed uh, in real life. And now to like the most interesting part to the modeling approach approaches themselves. We'll start sort of with uh, simpler models and, and go uh, step by step to, to the most uh, complicated ones developed so far. So the most naive and most simple approach to do is actually to take the additional treatment column, uh, column I mentioned in the very beginning and, and say like, okay, we have one new column, let's just use it as a feature, right? It's like a binary signal, pre pretty obvious, let's use it as a feature. And then uh, we fit any machine learning model you like to basically use the features plus this additional column to predict the outcome column. And during inference or when testing your model, you can uh, make two predictions. The first one will be, what is the prediction for this particular user when the treatment column is one? So we sort of simulate that this user got their treatment minus the prediction uh, when this column is actually zero. Uh, and then we assume that this difference would be the more or less accurate estimate of an uplift. That's a very simple idea, but it rarely works as sort of my experience at least shows. And uh, the major reason for that is that basically if your treatment column is not a powerful feature, it will be outperformed by other features. And basically your single model that you train will be really good at predicting your target, but really bad at capturing this uplift. So both these predictions will be more or less the same and uh, the difference will be just noise. So the single learner is like a simple concept, but rarely sort of used to, to my knowledge. Then there's another uh, approach also simple but uh, kind of different, it's called target transformation. The idea is that uh, we take our data set and we transform our target. So our target metric Y becomes Z. Uh, the formula for transforming it is very simple. Basically, whenever the true target is one and the treatment is also one, we say that this is one and the other way around. If the treatment was zero and the target was zero, we also say that zero. All, all the other cases for Z will be zero. And then apparently uh, some Simple math shows you that uh, your uplift can be estimated as two times probability of Z being one minus one. To be honest, I didn't find any uh, sort of beautiful intuition behind that, but the math is also not that complicated. You can uh, digest it later on. We'll skip it for the sake of time. Uh, there's two sort of notes. First of all, this is much better than the previous approach, but still it's very simple and doesn't work always. And the other one is that since we are predicting the probability of the new target to be one, it actually uh, doesn't work with continuous targets. So you can't really say that Y is revenue or average amount of clicks or average amount of visits or, or something else, only with like stuff like conversion or retention or, and so on. So this is important to, to, to keep in mind. And then we dive deeper into uh, more sophisticated models. The first big family is called meta learners. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about why it's meta later. Uh, and the very first one is called uh, T learner. T stands for two. Uh, the idea line is apparently wrong. I, 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 sorry, for, sorry about that. So basically the main idea uh, about the T learner is that you actually, uh, in comparison to the single learner, you actually take two machine learning models and you train them on different uh, parts of the training data set. One of them uh, is trained on the treated users, so on those who have a W column of one, and the other one is treated on uh, those users who have never got any treatment, so no promotion, no discounts, no anything. You, tra you, tra uh, you train two separate models, and then the idea is the same as in the first model. During inference or during applying the model on your problem, uh, you evaluate each single user twice with each of the models, take the difference, and that apparently could be a great uh, estimate of your uplift. And in practice, that's uh, already a very solid baseline and it works, works quite well, but there are still some uh, problems with it sometimes. For example, here this uh, very artificial toy example shows you uh, such, such a scenario. So imagine that we have a data set with only one feature X and one target column Y, uh, and the red part of the data set are the treated users and the blue part of the data set are the untreated users. So in both of these parts of the data set, the relationship between X and Y is very obvious, right? So each of the models trained separately on them will be very good at predicting uh, this relationship. But it turns out that if you, in this particular example, if you take the difference between the red dots and each corresponding blue dot, the relationship will be somewhat uh, like the black square. And there you can already see that um, it's kind of different uh, from what the relationship between X and Y and the original data set is. In this uh, sort of very artificial but still relevant example, 
uh, a t-learner would fail drastically. Uh, and that's why you need to always sort of uh, keep that in mind as well. And uh, most probably it won't, like the t-learner won't work very well uh, if you have sort of smaller data. So if you have a lot of data, then probably yes, but uh, with smaller data, you need to be careful. Uh, an extension of that uh, is the so-called x-learner. This is the last slide with sort of this kind of mess, so bear with me, it will be interesting after that. <laughs> Uh, the first step in the X-learner is the same as in the T-learner. You take uh, both parts of the data set and train two, mod two models, all the same. Uh, one model predicts the untreated users, the other one predicts the treated users. But on the second step, uh, you do this cross predictions. That's why it's called X-learner. So for the treated model, you take the untreated part of the data set and you predict. So for, with, with this model, you predict for the other part of the data set and you get a prediction of the target. And you do the other way around. So with the untreated model, you take the treated guys and you do again the prediction and you, get, and you have like a prediction for their target. Using the real target, you can then calculate the difference. And apparently this difference is already an estimate of the uplift, so of the improvement for each training sample. And that can be used to train two new models. So now you have on step two, you already have two new models which both predict already the uplift. So you're not uh, evaluating the Y column anymore, you directly predict uh, your uplift, which is great, which is like the goal uh, of our modeling. And on the third step, you just uh, take the weighted average. In case your A-B test had equal groups, so 50-50, then it will be just a regular average of, of the predictions of these two models tau. Uh, and like I said, people, uh, like there are even more sophisticated models. People, uh, as usually, are getting very creative at crafting uh, artificial loss functions to sort of capture uh, uplift. We won't dive deeper into this, but there are even more meta learners. Uh, I think DR stands for doubly robust, so apparently this thing is doubly robust. Uh, I don't think that for practical reasons it's really uh, useful to know basically uh, every single detail here, but it's worth knowing that they're sort of simpler models and go, then go step by step to the more complicated ones if you're looking for quality improvement. Uh, and the great thing about meta learners is basically that they are meta. Uh, apparently they don't have to do anything with Facebook. Uh, it's just that you can plug in any model you like. So basically LightGBM, CatBoost, XGBoost, any scikit learn fit predict style model can be put in any of these meta learners and uh, you, can, you can play around with uh, any model you like. So this is really convenient and this is really powerful and you don't have to rely on sort of uh, bad implementations of any additional libraries. You can use like the classic stuff and it will work uh, just great with like in your new setup, in your new prediction paradigm. And another big family of models is uh, tree-based models. Just like in classical machine learning, you can use uh, decision trees to evaluate your uplift as well. Uh, we'll consider one uh, particular example. It should be sort of very intuitive, I hope so. So imagine we again have the same data set. Uh, I just show you a few, slide back, a few slides back. And uh, we want to sort of find a split in this data set that will maximize sort of any, that will maximize some metric we are looking, we are looking for. Uh, before doing uh, the split, let's calculate what will be the average treatment effect, what will be like the average improvement in this part of the data set. For this, we need to calculate the uplift on like the treated guys. Uh, so we take only these two rows and calculate the average target. Then we do the same for the untreated guys. And we see like that the average improvement in general is zero. So basically, if you have, uh, if you have conducted such, a, such an A-B test, you actually wouldn't see any effect. But it doesn't mean that this data set is useful, use, useless. We can actually make use of it. So let's imagine that uh, after we sort of evaluated that, somehow we found out that uh, we need to split our data set according to the following rule. I, I basically made it up. It can be any rule. And uh, in, in the original decision tree algorithm, you go column by column and look for each possible split and try to use the most efficient one. So let's imagine that we are checking this particular split. Feature 2 has to be greater than 0. Okay. Let's split the data set like this. Uh, and now we have a left child and a right child. And as we can see in the left child already, uh, the average treatment effect is uh, positive. So for every treated user in this part of the data set, uh, we have an improvement. And it's the other way around uh, in the left child. So this is exactly the case I told you about previously with Netflix. So in this part of the tree, in this part of the decision tree, we have all those users who, if treated, 
will actually do the other thing you don't expect them to do. So this is like the, the decision tree basically like in classical machine learning, it's clustering, like separating users according to their response to your uh, personalized treatment. And um, basically, yeah, uh, like I said, before the split, we didn't have any effect. After the split, we had uh, completely different effects in each of the parts. So the difference uh, became bigger. And this is one of the metrics we could use when building our uh, decision tree. Uh, and this is uh, what we have just done, visualized in like a simple chart. And there are other criteria, more classical as well. For example, the kullback labor divergence, Euclidean distance, or uh, basically any other distribution, uh, distribution difference measure can be used uh, as a split criteria. Uh, and whenever there's a tree, by the way, that's like a real screenshot of a real tree. So whenever there's a tree, uh, the great thing is that you can build a random forest. So random uplift forests are a uh, thing, like our real thing, and they are also really powerful. So uh, keep that in mind as well if you li would like to experiment with uh, uplift modeling. Uh, a few words about our use cases at Flow and how we utilize that. So our most successful story so far with uplift modeling is uh, the so-called flexible discounts. Uh, basically, during different promotion campaigns, we uh, used to give our users uh, discounts for subscriptions, and we did it in a personalized fashion. And depending on the season and in different uh, regions and countries, it actually brought us an additional 7 to 25, depending on the location, uh, a revenue per user, which is like really stonks. <laughs> Um, but potential further use cases we are playing around uh, at the moment and will be playing hopefully in the future are the following. So for example, uh, we do a lot of push notifications. Like I said, we have 250 million users uh, and it's actually uh, worth optimizing the best time when you send push notifications to certain users because they might respond differently and they may actually uh, be sort of more engaged with your app this way. Uh, another thing to optimize is actually the first user experience, so basically the user journey when they install your app. Uh, and this can be also done with uplift modeling in a combination with, for example, multi-armed bandits. When you uh, write during the onboarding, you can sort of switch around different screens or for each particular user, you can select their personalized journey through the app. Uh, and this is also often called uh, next best action recommender system. Uh, there's also obviously churn modeling. We actually didn't try it yet in terms of uplift modeling. So churn modeling or win back campaigns uh, through the uplift modeling uh, framework. Uh, and one of the most sort of ambitious ideas I had and hopefully we'll be able to, real, uh, to, to make it happen uh, is the integration with uh, our A-B testing platform because we have an in-house A-B testing platform. And sort of my, my dream would be to uh, have the opportunity for every conducted experiment instead of rolling out the winner group. So for example, imagine we test a green button versus a red button, and then we uh, conduct an experiment and we see that the green button is better. So we sort of can roll it out for everyone, but the better version, in my opinion, would be to uh, personalize it. So you get a green one, you get a red one, the other person gets a green one again. Uh, and this is like a powerful thing to do because you could basically even beat the best performing s s single group. So hopefully this uh, will be done somewhere in the future. Um, yeah, also a few data sources for you uh, to play around with if you're interested in the topic. Basically, there are a bunch of libraries. The most powerful uh, I found was Causal ML by Uber. It's really great except for the decision tree part. Uh, it's actually pretty slow because it's implemented in Python and apparently no one has yet re-implemented it completely in C++. Uh, I was thinking about it, but then it's sort of really, really hard to do because like projects like XGBoost or CatBoost, they haven't been developed in like two nights. It's, it's a really big job, so may, may, maybe someone will contribute to that. But uh, for now, uh, decision trees from causal ML work only on smaller data sets. The meta learners work basically on hundreds of thousands or millions of, of, of samples if you have them. Uh, EconML is an alternative from Microsoft. It's kind of the same, uh, but to be honest, I haven't tried it. Uh, hopefully it's good because LightGBM is also good and it's also from Microsoft. And there are two more libraries called scikit-lift and pylift. They are less about models and more about uh, evaluating them, which is, by the way, a separate topic on its own. Apparently we didn't have enough time and I may be, at some point of time, I will make a separate talk about how to evaluate uplift models. Uh, and a little bit more literature for those of you who like more sort of scientific-like articles. There's a great overview paper. It's uh, fairly fresh. I think it's from 2020 
uh, it has like an overview of all of these um, models like and modeling approaches I mentioned. Uh, in the causal ML library itself, they have like a really great documentation and a one-stop shop for everyone who is eager to learn more about uplift modeling. And there's also a great data set with uh, benchmarking all of these approaches against the biggest known open source data sets. So there are some data sets out there uh, which you can try to play around with when you start learning this. Um, and I think that having been said, uh, that's it. And by the way, uh, we are hiring. That's really, uh, I was surprised myself, but I just learned it yesterday that we have, uh, we'll be hiring for a data scientist into our health team, not this team, but uh, doing health research. So if you're interested, please contact me. If you have any questions, contact me as well. I'll be here around after the talks. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>